What is going on, everybody? Welcome back to round two or part two of this reaction video of conservative parents versus liberal teachers. Sorry I couldn't get it all in one uh, one shot. Um, while that was the goal, uh, having to tend to dad duties uh, did not allow for me to do it all in one part, so I figured breaking it up into two parts would just make it easy. So if you haven't watched the first, uh, the first part of this video, please do by clicking the card up in the corner, um, or there will be a link in the description for part one. Please go watch that first, and then come back to part two to see the second part, uh, or the second half of the conservative parents versus liberal teachers uh, by Jubilee. Um, so, uh, I, I part one had some strong thoughts to it. Um, I don't, I don't necessarily know what part two will will hold. Uh, but I think we're just going to jump right into it and see what, uh, what Jubilee has for us on this episode of Middle Ground. So let's just get right into it. All right. So it looks like this next segment is going to be teachers with guns make schools safer. I already know that this is a hot topic without even having to watch <laughs> any of this, but, uh, I'm curious to see what the liberal teachers have to say. Uh, in comparison to the conservative parents. So let's just jump right into it. Teachers with guns make schools safer. The data guy, of course, does not seem too thrilled. So. so I was really in between. I didn't really know how I felt about this issue at first. Um, but then I started looking at uh, places that had armed their teachers so I believe that model is good it has to be voluntary yes. so the teachers have to want to do it themselves they have to be well trained yes. they have to have uh, background checks periodically that has been successful if, if we're trusting teachers which in some cases we do in some cases we don't but if my mindset is that if we're gonna trust teachers to mold our children's minds and educate them they're there for eight hours a day we should also trust and kind of enable them to protect themselves and our kids physically I think by no means should we ever force a teacher to carry a gun but if a, a teacher is willing to take on the responsibility of learning how to handle a weapon properly I think that we should allow them to do that for us and it frankly would be an incredible service to us so really quick I, I just wanted to give my two cents I'm a little bit torn on this because um, I, I know they touched on it a little bit but my particular issue with all of this is I just don't know if Putting the guns in the hands of teachers, not necessarily knowing their mental state. I mean, background checks and all that stuff uh, is a win. But who's to say that that teacher is 100% mentally fit to be able to carry a gun in the classroom in the first place? Um, I know that the you know the, the profession is is that they're there to care for the students, and that's kind of their entire uh, their entire life is surrounded uh, uh, around that child's well being. Not, not the child, the children's well-being, but the that would be my number one concern. However, uh, the one thing that I would add that I would request is not just background checks frequently, but it would be regular training of that firearm to ensure that the teacher is apt and capable of handling that firearm given the event of an active school shooter or the need to defend the children in any way. Um, now the reason that I would be in favor of it is because with school shootings being what seems to be more and more prevalent every single year, it seems like they're happening more often is that you never see, uh, an active shooter at a gun convention. You never see an active shooter, you know, uh, where there is a high likelihood of somebody carrying a gun it is usually in places where people are unable to defend themselves and schools is uh, uh schools are one of those areas where you know there's defenseless children and teachers that are defenseless and are not able to fight back against the shooter so where i'm getting with all of that is that i think that having a threat to the threat <laughs> would be optimal to be able to defend our children because if a school shooter comes in knowing the teachers are carrying guns and are there to protect the children or you know somebody is there consistently protecting our children that it would be much less likely to happen Hi. 
All right, so just to break it open, this conversation is so much more nuanced than to arm or not to arm. And if you want to save a school, you need to get parental engagement. Let's look at the mindset of the individuals that are going into these homes with firearms. Those individuals are not mentally okay. There's something wrong at happening, whether it's at school, in the house, whether it's, who knows, maybe it's the, something they're consuming online. And I think that's the parent's job to continue to engage to make sure that child is healthy. A lot of these kids as well that are going into schools that are not mentally um, healthy, they, they're coming from single parent households, they're, coming, they're living with their grandparents, there's something, there's something intrinsically with their identity that's broken and I think that... That's something that I touched on uh, in, in part one is that um, uh, having fatherless households uh, definitely damages children in more ways than I think that we understand um, and, and having a father in the home will definitely prevent a lot of issues. Not necessarily saying that the men mental instability as a whole, but um, having a father in the home is definitely beneficial in a variety of ways. And I just wanted to add that little nugget before we continue. Whether you arm a school or you don't, it's not gonna change it if you don't address the real issue. I agree with you that people yeah. that are you know, perpetrating these crimes and these like mass casualties are messed up individuals, I would absolutely agree. Uh, mass shootings are a uniquely American problem. So if we try to understand what's the root, why is America solely have that problem, I would say it's a gun culture problem. So if the idea is, you know, should we try to remove aspects of gun culture that really purvey in our society, um, should we do that or should we just increase the amount of firearms we can have in every single space just so that way we're properly ready for a gunfight whenever I want to clarify up. gun culture. Are you saying that there's like the shoot 'em up bang 'em up video games? Are you saying No, I wouldn't say it's video games. I'd say institutions like the NRA that heavily impose, you know, <laughs> you need to own not just firearms but as many firearms as you can. I so really quick before we listen to what Mason the liberal teacher has to say, one of, one of the things uh, that makes guns more prevalent in America is a the second amendment and B, well, I, I mean, it ties into the Second Amendment, but B, the fact that we as a free society are able to go purchase guns to defend ourselves from whoever, whatever threat may, may be there. The problem is, is the education around guns as well as the safety of guns in the home, um, which is one thing that I am adamant about is that if you, if you are going to have guns in your home, they need to be stored and secured properly. Um, and and uh, I think having gun safes and all that stuff is is fine and dandy, but it needs to be done properly because if you you know if you have it where your code is one 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 to get into the safe and your kid could easily figure that out, that is obviously a big big problem. Um, and then the other thing, which I know this is probably going to be a hot take, and and a lot of people might disagree with me on this, but I think the other side of the coin is to educate our children uh, with guns. Um, I'm not saying put guns in the hands of, you know, of toddlers or whatever, but teaching kids to fear guns or not necessarily to fear them, but I guess a more appropriate word would be to respect guns and the damage that they can cause will allow for a much more well-rounded look into why guns are so prevalent in America and uh, how they could also be uh, to our benefit rather than to our detriment. This fear of guns by giving it to, you know, giving all the power to people with guns is a little back ass words is probably the best way to put it. Personally would not like to be armed. Uh, I do not want to take lethal action in the classroom and I, I want to make it a safe and inclusive environment. Army teachers is a response measure to particular violence that goes on in our schools here in America. And personally, I think we should focus more towards solutions to prevent these occurrences from happening rather than just implementing responses implying that these actions will occur. I, and I'm just going to be honest with you. Really quick before we let Data Guy continue, and that's just how I'm going to refer to him is, is Data Guy because he's already getting under my skin and I haven't even really heard much of what he had to say. But <laughs> um, putting... I find it a little ironic that this guy says he doesn't want to use lethal action if somebody with a gun were to enter the school. However, if you were to put him in a situation where somebody with a gun is entering his school, my bet would be is that he would want to have a gun rather than not. Um, I could be wrong, but 
I know that if I were put in a situation where I didn't have a gun, somebody is coming after me with a gun, that I would want a gun to defend myself. I'm not going to want to throw chairs or barricade doors in hopes and cross my fingers that that is going to do the trick when the person with the gun is trying to come and get me and the children that I'm there to protect. So anyways, let's just listen to what data guy has to say. You don't want me to have a gun because I, I had to go back to therapy in the last few months. And so I agree with a lot of what you guys are saying, what your plan was. But I would also say mental health. We got to understand some of these school shootings are done because people have snapped. People have natural biases and things like that. And people could act on those biases. Then they could be guns drawn and not a clear mind. You know, like as a parent, how would you feel knowing that you don't know which teachers have a gun? and you've had bad experiences with prior teachers. What if that teacher oh. that absolutely, you know, so blown my answer, up kind my of answer, thing. My answer to your question is, I feel the same way about the guard in front of my kid's school. I don't really know the guard, but he's gone through training, and I presume that he knows what he's doing, and frankly, I feel the same way about a police officer. I don't need the police officer, but they've gone through training, and they were willing to take on that responsibility, and so I would apply the same logic. It's so interesting that you bring that up, because it really ties back to why I feel like we need to be careful about how much responsibility we're saddling teachers with teaching our kids values, right? On the one hand, the system is saying, trust our teachers. They know better than you, parents. We should be able to teach them what they need to know about sexuality. On the other hand, you guys are admitting that Many teachers are not really uh, checked for mental issues. We don't really know what Good is happening point. in these classrooms. Great we don't point. know about what's not checked. Mm -hmm. We very frequently have like professional development days where we got self care. So I wouldn't say many by any means. And when I'm coming into the workplace, I'm not bringing in all my baggage as to say, you know, you go into your work, you're not like, oh, I'm so depressed, my kid's this, this, So that. why, if there is a teacher who is willing to step forward and will go through the training and will go through the screening, why not empower them to save, to save our kids? I mean, in Uvalde, if there was a teacher who could actually save those children, then maybe we would not have seen so much death. When we place teachers with... That, that that conservative parent just hit on so many so many points, and I think it's funny how quickly the teacher uh, backpedaled when she got called out on. You just said that teachers aren't necessarily always mentally fit to handle a gun, so but you're saying that they're mentally fit to teach about sexuality, which is another controversial topic. And then she immediately backpedals and saying, "Whoa, whoa, 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 whoa! I'm not saying that." Uh, we do have professional development days and all this stuff. Uh, I, I think she just didn't want to be called out and have to say, oh, you're right, because, you know, that's that's a, a hard to swallow pill right there. So uh, anyways, let's continue with a firearm in the classroom. It takes the instance of a violent occurrence from a possibility in the minds of these children to an inevitability. But in the, the children don't children. know it is a concealed and carry weapon that has gone through the process of the local sheriff's department, background check, training, yeah, checkups, no one knows everything. But the teacher no one knows. And the, the, I, um, police department. I have a logistical question. Yeah. Does this teacher have the gun on them? Yes. You wouldn't it know. It is holstered all, on them all yeah. at all times. It's a concealed okay. carry. You, it should so just, never just be in a place of a child. Concealed carry. It's illegal. No, to I know what a concealed carry is. I just want to clarify. My thing and why. I, why this question sort of enrages me. Why are we asking teachers to carry guns? When did this become an occupational hazard? When did we walk into school and people were like, by the way, you could be shot today. So maybe you want to have your Glock strapped on you because who knows, this might be your last day on earth. That is ridiculous. If you 50 years ago were to look at a teacher and be like, hey, do you want to hold this gun with you? You know, like you might need it. They're going to scratch their heads and look at you funny. This is opening up a bigger conversation, right? But I think that even though it is voluntary, right, we still need to have this conversation. Like it still needs to happen of why, even if a teacher was willing to carry a gun to school, they are even having to be asked to do that in the first place. Okay, so it looks like they're, they're going to be moving on to another topic here. And I just wanted to kind of summarize my thoughts on this, especially on what that last teacher said. Uh, you're right. If you were to ask teachers, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago, if they wanted to bring a gun to school, uh, you know, to do their job, uh, to be able to protect the children, you know, like, hey, you know, here's your standard issue Glock, uh, as well as your ruler and your expo markers for the whiteboard, uh, they, they might scratch their head, which is true. The problem is, is that school shootings have be uh, the people who commit these violent acts against our children have achieved almost a status of celebrity they go down in history books as like people do it for fame the kids do it for fame that's a hundred percent why like they admit it in their own you know d documentaries of the you know they're not doing it because 
uh, uh, anything other than I'm going to commit this violent act and people are going to remember my name forever. Like, if we stop talking about the people and addressing them by their name, not saying that if this event happens, we don't talk about it, but if we don't, you know, refer to them by name and give them, uh, you know, their name blotched on the internet forever, then that's one big thing. Another thing is that, again, like I had mentioned at the beginning of this, is that if you fight the threat of guns with having the threat of guns and putting putting it in a putting the shooter in a position to decide with you know, how many people can I take down before I get blasted myself um when those chances go way 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 down because they have to worry about getting shot immediately uh, as soon as they pull that gun from their backpack or whatever because a teacher is armed or is uh, there are armed guards at at the doorways it's not saying that you know our schools are unsafe if anything they become more safe it's like when you go into a bank and there's, you know, the security guard standing at the front door that's strapped to the freaking teeth with guns, you don't say, you know, dang, this bank must be unsafe. You probably go in there feeling that it's even more safe because if somebody were to break in and try and do something, there are people there to stop them. Um, you know, there, there's a reason that, you know, high profile individuals walk around with security and it's because they want to feel safe. Um, not necessarily saying something is going to happen, but if something did happen, they are more likely to survive any sort of attack on them. Um, so anyway, so let's, let's, uh, let's keep going on. I just wanted to throw that in before they move on to the next topic, which it looks like they are right now. So let's continue. All but one. Wow. Every day I wake up and I hand to you guys the most precious thing in my entire life, my children. I think that it's important that our society will reflect how much we value you guys. I think that you should receive bonuses if you do a great job. If you're able to represent all of us as Americans, both conservatives and liberals, and you're able to speak on our behalf and take care of our children, we should reward you for that and you should feel rewarded for that. And so I don't know exactly what you make, but I think it is really important that we, we invest in you and we pour into you. And when I see the entire budget that the state of California, for example, spends on education, and I realize that a sliver fraction of it only goes to you guys, it breaks my heart and frankly, it makes me so angry. I don't need more bureaucrats. I need more good teachers. I, I left the K through 12 and went to the community college and I do, I do pretty well. I'm not, I'm, so I'm gonna be clear with that, but also I have a so master's. So you're not oppressed, thank so God. So I'm, I'm I'm, I have a master's, but I had to work really hard to get where I'm at. Of course. But, um, I, but I'm also in a doctoral program and you're right, I'm paying out of pocket too. Again, I had a student the other day saying, I can't pay my electric bill. How much is your electric bill? I'll pay your electric bill. And so I put up students in hotels because they have nowhere to live. I have a student who doesn't have a family. I, you know, he, he told me the other day, I want, I need a dad. I said, I'll be your father because it just broke my heart <laughs> that at night. Okay. Hold on really quick. I, I kind of have to call, you know, I commend data guy for, for doing what he does. If he does what he does. And I'm not saying that he's lying, but I just find it a little bit ironic that when it comes to benefit him and his salary and his pay, all of a sudden he's paying electric bills and putting kids up in hotels. But then when we're talking about uh, controversial topics and sexuality being taught in the classroom and addressing kids by pronouns, he's immediately saying, your kid is not special enough. Your kid does not de deserve my, my attention. I have 300 students to worry about. And I'm not going to teach any or treat any of them differently or teach them differently than I would any other student. Um, when he's trying to make it seem like he is all about equality on that front. But then when it's like, Oh, you're, you're paying out of pocket for kids, electric bills. It's like, Oh, I do that on the regular man. Like I'm, I'm data man. <laughs> so I just, I just wanted to point that out. Not saying that he, you know, what he's saying is, uh, is a lie or anything like that. I, I, I believe that he has done this in the past. Uh, I just think that it's a little bit funny that when it comes to the argument of, uh, increasing teachers pay. He's like, yeah, I pay out of pocket for all this stuff. Cause I care about my, my students when, you know, tw 20 minutes prior, he's saying that he does not care about his students because he has so many of them and that he's just there to do a job because he signed a contract continuing 19 year old is in this world alone. Doesn't have family. Yeah, I would be scared to like calculate how much I spent in my for my classroom, right? Yes. Like all the materials, all the things that I'm purchasing, all the things that I'm doing. And it's just interesting to think that we are always told like teachers are heroes, they're teaching the youth of America, but also we're not going to give you enough money to survive comfortably. 
Like, you're going to struggle every day. There have been days when I go to work and I'm like, am I going to have money to put gas in my car? I guess we're going to find out, right? And I know so many other teachers who are struggling to keep afloat. I can't even imagine having a, I can't even think about having a family as a teacher. I think that growing up. So one thing I wanted to, to, to touch on, um, because she made a really good point. I, I'm, I'm an advocate for maybe changing the pay structure for teachers. Not necessarily saying they need to get paid more or get paid less. However, that pans out or shakes out in the restructuring, I'm I'm all for. One thing that I think it's messed up, my mom is a teacher, and I think it is complete bullshit that teachers have to pay out of pocket for a variety of supplies for their students. And there's no, uh, from what I understand, there is no reimbursement. There is no, we'll pay you back. There is no, you know, uh, company account, even though it's a school, like a district account that the teachers can, can go to. Uh, and like I said, I can be you know sorely mistaken or completely wrong, but from what I understand, a majority of the time when teachers need supplies for the class, they are paying out of pocket for all of their students. Uh, and I and I, I think that's pretty I think that's pretty messed up when a teacher you know is making depending on where they're at forty to sixty grand a year, and they're not they're trying to pay you know all of their bills and take care of their things and like like she mentioned, pay for the gas just to get to the school to be able to pay or to teach our children. They're now having to pay out of pocket for supplies to be able to aid in the teaching of children, which I think is totally messed up. So um, that's that's one little bit there. Uh, I think that that teachers need to be uh, uh, one thing. You know, one thing I believe in is performance based pay. Um, I think if a teacher is uh, excelling and their, their students are reflecting their, their teaching efforts. And maybe they have a high turnout of high performing kids with high grades or, or whatever, like maybe they're paid off of aptitude tests or something. I don't know. I, I haven't thought about this. This is just off the, off the cuff. This could be a completely disastrous idea, but you know, the per performance based pay allows for the cream to rise to the top. The best teachers get paid the most and the worst teachers get paid the least. Just a thought, but I think we continue to hear what Kayla, the liberal teacher, has to say. I was not the strongest student. I didn't necessarily see the point in what we were doing. And I think that ultimately that felt like it was because education was something that I had to get through, not necessarily something that I was obtaining. But I think what really pushed me to go into teaching was wanting to give kids a space where they didn't feel the way I feel growing up, where they felt like they had power to make choice in their education and that their education could be powerful in aiding them to do what they wanted to do. So I'm not a teacher. I don't know how much you guys make. And I'm not going to use you as the example. I'm going to use a friend of mine. She's been at a, a school for a number of years. I want to say it's six, seven, eight years, and she's become tenured. And through her tenureship, she's accumulated so much wealth. I'm appalled at how much she's making because she teaches Spanish to sixth graders, and she's making over $150,000 a year. Wow. Can I ask you a question? What kind of school does she work at? Public school. Interesting. Yeah. And it, so I mean, how me, much it, experience goes on with that, too? It must, I'm assuming, because yeah. you've invested into your career, which I think right. everybody should. But for me, I look at it as you're making $150,000 in nine months. I, I, the prompt that, that is true right there. So the, he, he got, kind of just dropped a bomb, I think, on the whole conversation. Um, where I live, teachers don't make that much. I know that these guys, I think, oh, well, I don't say I know. I would assume, based off of the conversation that they're ha having, they are based in California. Uh, California obviously is completely broken, and uh, the way that their everything is structured is ridiculous. I think a Spanish teacher making one hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year is ridiculous, especially with the one point that he is he is talking about that these teachers are teaching maybe nine months out of the year, um, and I'm sure that the teachers are going to school him or whatever on this point uh, of you know the nine months or whatever. But again, my mom is a teacher, and three months out of the year. She is sitting back, uh, not doing a whole lot. I mean, you know, she might be prepping for the school year, the next school year during the summer occasionally, but she's basically getting paid for three months of vacation, um, not to mention, you know, the, the Christmas break, spring break, uh, fall break, and all of the other holidays in between uh, where she gets day, uh, days off. Um, I would absolutely kill to be in my profession and get paid $150,000 a year to only work nine months of the 12 months. So let's listen to what these, these teachers have to say to school our conservative parent. Clearly was our teachers paid enough. Yes. And I mean, we're not. I've had to work second jobs doing DoorDash mm -hmm. just because I wasn't making enough. I'm, if you look at these shoes, they are ripped, they are broken from a teacher wish list. 
I could not even buy these shoes myself. You know what I'm saying? Sure. I don't make enough money. So I wanted to clarify, this isn't an absolute. I'm not saying that every teacher is paid enough. I have no idea what your salary is. I have no idea any of those details. I'm just recognizing that if a teacher is getting nine months and their salary is in nine months, they get a summer off. Most, most of society isn't given three months to just That's go That's assuming they have three months. I'm an 11 month employee for one whole month out of the year. I'm not paid anything, Same. nothing. I have to figure out my funds, save money that I don't have to try to supply for a month, month and a half. I, I don't get supplementary, supplementary income. Like that doesn't happen. Critical race theory is anti-American. That was a pretty, that was a pretty quick, uh, uh, subject to rule over. And I think, you know, I gave a lot of thoughts on such a short topic, but, um, uh, it seems like there is a discrepancy between what that one conservative parent was saying versus everybody else in terms of the pay. Um, I, you know, I don't doubt for a fact that there are teachers in California that get paid $150,000 a year in the public school system. Um, but the other teachers seem to completely disagree with that. Um, I do know that there are some teachers out there that get paid an absorbent amount of money. Um, and, and especially in this, in, in my state, there are teachers that get paid stupid amounts of money for very little work, um, in the grand scheme of things, not saying that they don't do a lot of work, but I'm saying in the grand scheme for what they get paid, the work, the trade off for them is very little. So, um, let's just, let's, let's go on to their critical race theory is anti-American. Well, I'll go first. Uh, my daughter, uh, same teacher actually, who was asking about her pronouns, she said that she was gonna be introducing some race-themed books. My daughter recorded this conversation in class. So what proceeded to happen is she started to talk to the children uh, in their, uh, I guess, identity groups. Oh, as an African-American child, how are you discriminated against? As an Asian child, she went through all of, except white people. It became Racism. total chaos in the classroom. There was no education going on here. There were, they were just literally going at each other, talking about how, who was more oppressed. It's not a matter of if something was racist, it's a matter of when something was racist or how the racist thing happened. So they automatically assume, critical race theorists, that racism is embedded into every single thing. How do you look a child, specifically a black child, in the eye and tell them, I'm sorry for you because of your skin color? There's no hope for you in the greatest country, literally for them, because black Americans are the most successful black people in the entire world. And then turn around and look at a white child and say, sorry, you're responsible for, our, for the atrocities of 200 years all, ago. All I have to add to that is that in our home and with our faith, I teach my children that it is um, awful to make someone feel hopeless or pitied. You're damning them to a future of failure yes. if you are telling them, oh, I pity you and I'm going to do these things for you instead of coming alongside them and supporting them and doing something for themselves that pulls them out of that hopelessness. And I think that those are two of the worst things that we can do as a broader society. You know what I love about America? My mother immigrated from Morocco. She's a Jewish person. Everywhere around the world, we're known as the Jew. In America, we're known as American. And I think there's something so powerful about empowering any community to be American and to succeed based on your own merit. We don't look back into why we can't. We look into why we can. And so when my family taught me since I was a little girl, I can, I can, I can, I learned that I could. And that's why I think this country has empowered me so much. I want to see the same thing for kids of all colors in the United States. But if we're taught, if we're teaching them that there is no hope for them and that people will always look at them in a different way, then how are they going to hear the message of I can? My question for liberal teachers is do they think that it's the right place for them to impose liberal ideas in classrooms knowing that they have many students who come from conservative families? And I find that many of the schools have become battlegrounds for those kinds of ideas. And when teachers are bringing those issues to the classrooms, it's forcing families and conservative kids to have to address these issues. And we believe that they're simply too young to deal with those kinds of complex um, matters at that age. Okay, so first of all, I think we need to define what critical race theory is. Critical race theory is a theory that Derrick Bell and Kimberly Crenshaw and a bunch of uh, former Harvard law students came up with, where they theorize that within certain American laws, racism is just embedded. And so I'm sorry for your experience, because you shouldn't have to go through that. 
Nobody should have to go through that. I don't tell my son you can't do anything. I have told my son you have to work twice as hard. I have to tell my son you're a black man in America. You need to. There are certain things you need to do to survive. I mean, first, I think Wrong. the idea that we are teaching children in critical race theory in schools is ridiculous. As he pointed out, this is a high level, like university level framework. You are not going to walk into like Isabel's elementary school fifth grade classroom and see Isabel telling these people about the legal structures. In my opinion, how I define myself as an American, right? I define myself as someone who is proud of my country, someone who can look at the mistakes that my country has made in the past and the things that are keeping other people oppressed and recognize that these are still existing and that we need to work towards changing that. So I don't see how critical race theory could be anti-American because that's how I define American. And I think it's very nuanced because people define American in many different ways, right? I actually right? don't completely disagree with your definition of it. I think that maybe you think it's systemic and I think it's the individual. But I think that even in nuanced ways, like the example that she gave, I've heard examples where my nieces have been segregated in the classroom at fourth and fifth grade. And like, well, did this happen to you? Do you have a two-parent home? Are your grandparents raising you? And like, there's this line of victimhood. And as a woman that has dealt with sexism, I do definitely teach my daughters, like as a girl in this country, it is going to be a different experience than your father had. Um, but I don't think it's beneficial at all to kind of institute that victimhood in their long-term mentality because then you actually start to see kids that are like, oh, well, they're different than me, so therefore their life could be better or worse than mine. And instead of engaging with those people, they step away. I don't believe that. So one, one of the things that really drives me nuts about the critical race theory conversation is that you are when you when you immediately bring up race to 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 kids and you you try and convince them that because they are a certain color they have it one way or the other you are immediately making them a victim in some degree and and whether you uh, believe it or not and the problem is is that when you uh, you're exacerbating the racism issue. It's is 100% racism when you're telling somebody because you are black, you are going to be treated this way. Even if it's coming from another black person, that is racism, 100%. You are setting that child up for failure by convincing them that because of their skin color, things are going to be different for them. And not saying that if, you know, there is a black kid and he experiences racism, that that is, you know, not wrong because that is wrong 100%. The problem is, is that you're telling them that because of their skin color, they were going to experience that everywhere they go, no matter what, and it is unavoidable. And that is 100% wrong. And and set, anything that has to do with race in the schools, uh, dividing kids up by race, asking them questions about race or anything like that is is racism in its entirety. That there's a victimhood to it. I think it's just kind of, amplifying that, hey, this is the truth, this is what happens, and let's move forward with that. Having that knowledge to be able to kind of navigate through life is better than just, oh, well, I assume I'm the same as, you know, my white counterpart. Oh, why is she able to do this? Why does she have this opportunity that I don't have? But they're the same. But she has that opportunity. They are the same, is what we're saying. I think what I, the difference is, we're stating normative statements, and you guys are claiming that we're presenting prescriptive claims. So the normative statement that we're presenting is, these events happen in American history. These are the outcomes that have led from those events. What you guys are saying is, we're then adding prescriptive statements, which is, that's why you should never really try, because you'll never make it in this country. That's well, not what I'm saying. What I am saying is that if you negatively press a child with these thoughts, that will be the outcome because that's how human beings work. This is a psychological fact. When you when you go to your when you go to your child or children in a school setting or any setting and you sit them down and you say historically this is what has happened to black people or to Asians or to Hispanics or to white people they are people are our brains are like hard drives they are downloading that information and they're going to store it forever and when you're telling them that because of their skin color they were treated this way and that there are laws in America that uh are inherently racist, which is wrong. Um, and because of that, we are, you are going to be treated this way. What, what you're telling them then is that there is no hope for them because of their skin color and that they should give up. You are not saying that directly, but that is what you are implying because you're saying that the laws are out there to get them. And what they're interpreting is, well, why try if the laws are out there to get me? Um, 
it's just it's so frustrating because you're not you're not giving them any hope any any you're not giving them any reason to want to strive forward uh and and be a decent human because you're just telling them that right off the bat that because of their skin color which is racism <laughs> that they're set, they're set up for failure it's ridiculous Two people. I believe it is the government's job. But look, our funding comes through government. I mean, our schools are government entities. So it Policy. is. Policies are government. Everything's government. I mean, if you're in public education, you're in government. That's li we're bureaucrats. That's literally our job. So it is government's job. So yeah, I, I believe it is. I believe it is the job of, of the government because schools are government. That's literally what they are. They're government institutions. Yes, I completely agree. Government provides a certain quality to education. Obviously, they haven't provided those funds. They haven't provided those policies that are pro-teacher or anything like that. So it really shows in our education, in kids, and all around. We're just not at the quality that other countries are at. I was going back and forth because what a government is, you know, oftentimes is characterized as like this entity of like a group of people up there deciding what goes on. Where no, like government is just collective organization. Does the government have a role in education? Absolutely. Uh, I think that parents have to play a role as well in, you know, not only being involved with what their kid is learning in school, uh, but also, you know, reinforcing strong educational skills. Um, and that doesn't happen unless there is parent involvement. I know the kids that are being worked on at home versus the kids that aren't. Uh, and it plays out in test scores, it plays out in their engagement in class, and it plays out in their behavior. You have to remember that we're a representative government, that it's based on the people, right? And so these public school systems are waiting for the parents to come in and say, this curriculum is not what I want to teach my kids. We, the taxpayers, control the curriculum. But the problem is we haven't been engaging in that system because we've been so distracted and, and, and pulled away from the education from our kids. No, I would agree. The communities need to absolutely be more involved in their school boards and what's going on in education. And unfortunately, we don't have that. And oftentimes, a lot of politicians, albeit Republicans that are trying to cut a lot of social programs and a lot of social investment, as well as corporate Democrats who want to cut a lot of social investment, uh, both of those, you know, we see areas of corruption within our education system. Well, and let, let's be clear on what we're talking about government is. So when we talk about a local, on a local level, it is government. That's literally what government is. When your kid goes into the school, they're going into a government institution. So I think when we're talking, we're not talking about parents not being involved. I want you involved. Heck, please be involved. So I think our issue, when we were talking about government, we weren't talking about excluding parents. We were talking about it is government's job to make this entity, which is public education, function. It has to. If government's not involved, you have no money. So you guys teach in government schools, public schools. Essentially, you're teaching a diverse student body. You have conservatives, you have liberals. How can you better represent us, half of this country? It's sadly causing us to lose faith in you guys. We want to support you guys. We want to send our kids to your schools and your classrooms. And I think that when we talk about all these differences, you know, how do we um, sort of represent both of these sides? Right? How do we bring these people together? I think it's also really important to remember that historically, this curriculum is one-sided in favor of conservative views in favor of supporting white students, not students of color. Wrong, wrong. I, sorry, I had to, I had to mute them to be able to put that. That is one hundred percent wrong. The education system is not one hundred percent in favor of white students and conservative people. It is one hundred percent, ninety nine percent run by liberals, without a doubt. It, the proof is in the numbers. You could survey all these teachers. Every, Every single teacher, aside from the exception of a few, falls liberal. And it's, I, I think that's a problem. Um, and so you're relying on conservative value parents to combat liberal teachers. Um, and, and really quick to kind of tie into the government, you know, the quality of education is a government's job before they finish this up. Um, I, I would agree with what a majority of the people said besides data man who every time he opens his mouth is in a condescending tone and makes it seem like he knows more than everybody else um is that people do need to be more involved with their schools and the curriculum that is being taught and they need to go to school board meetings and things like that to be able to 
voice their concerns about the curriculum at hand. Um, I think the community involvement is huge. It is definitely not done enough. Um, I am 100% guilty of that. I have, uh, I have not spoken up uh, uh, about the curriculum that is taught at my children's schools, and uh, it's, it's probably something that needs to be done. The issue is, is that they just kind of do it so in a nonchalant uh, uh, factor or a manner where they basically have this meeting. It's done. It's 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 quick and over, and then they just proceed with the curriculum. They don't make the, this big, you know. Hey, if you want to be involved, you know, come here at this day at this time. So um, that again, that might just be you know an issue on my own part of becoming more involved. But uh, I would ing- agree with most of them that it is not. It is not the government's job, and it needs to be more of a community involvement because at the end of the day, it is our tax dollars that are paying for our children to go to these schools to learn what they what they need to be uh, what they need to be taught. So, let's get this video wrapped up, and I'll give some final thoughts. Right, and so I think that we really, as a country, need to take a look at our education system. I think we can all agree that there needs to be a lot of change in the system, right? And look at how we can build a system that. Rep- the last thing is just a little little. <laughs> I don't know why it really bothers me when people do this is when they're making a point and they want everybody to agree with them and they feel like they're making a unanimously agreed upon statement is that they shake their head and they say, we would all agree, right? Like, no, that's why you're having a debate. <laughs> that's why you're having a debate as conservative parents versus liberal teachers. That is what this entire video was about. And you're ever saying, well, we could all agree that changes need to be made, right? Like, Yeah, maybe a couple of changes here and there, but clearly you all are on one side for the most part and the conservative teacher or the conservative parents are on another side and the changes that need to be made are what are disagreed on, which is why the the video even is here in the first place. Anyways, let's finish this for real for realsies now. Let's finish this video. Represents, reflects, validates the experiences and identities of everybody. Beautiful. <laughs> oh well, I guess I could have just let the video finish. So, anyways, uh, <laughs> let me give you let me give you some final thoughts here, really quick. Okay, so I I have some. There was a lot of there was a lot of different things that were touched on there, and I was really getting frustrated with a lot of a lot of the points being made and not, not maybe not frustrated but concerned is probably a better a better word to use with the points that are being made um because uh, with a lot of the points that were being made about how our children should be taught um with with how they should be protected when they are in the hands of the school system um when they're being addressed as oh I don't get paid enough to do that or I didn't sign up for this or whatever well you kind of did like your job is to care for my child while you are teaching them and not saying that you shouldn't get paid more if you're being required to carry a gun when you're on you know school grounds or whatever um you know hey this is what you signed up for and if you don't quit and find a different job you know i'm not i don't mean to be ruthless or or whatever about it but man it's that's that's one particular uh, one particular circumstance. Um, you know, critical race theory is really frustrating um, across the board because uh, as soon as you bring up race and you start convincing our children that they are different ba- because of their skin color, uh, you're setting them up for failure right off the bat. Have you ever seen toddlers of different races playing together, and you don't see? Like, for example, my boys, uh, when they were in daycare, uh, a variety of different ethnicities in the in the daycare that they went to, and you would never see, I would never hear my boys get in the truck after I pick them up uh, from daycare, and they're like, I played with a black kid today, and he was t- like completely different from me, and he's oppressed, and blah, 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 blah. It is, it is a hunk of junk, uh, uh, topic that you're you're ingraining in our children they they don't know any better because we don't teach them that there are differences in them because of their skin color they just assume that that person has darker skin than them but they don't look at them through the lens of race uh and and 
it drives me nuts. I don't want to get too carried away and off, you know, I want to keep my composure as best as possible. One thing, um, one thing that uh, with the critical race theory, like I said, is I'm not saying that we don't acknowledge differences when it comes to race. All I'm saying is that when we teach people that they are oppressed because of their race or that they are different because of their race, that is racism in its entirety. And one thing that <laughs> it's always, I don't know if I'd call it a gotcha or whatever, because it's not really a gotcha, but it's its one thing that I always like to to kind of uh, throw out there when people are having the race debate on people being oppressed or or anything like that is that when you go to somebody of any color, any ethnicity, other than white, of course, because that's always the argument that they use, is that if you were to go just to a black person, for example, and say, because you are black, you are oppressed, you are oppressing them by saying that. You telling them that they are oppressed is oppressing them. People do not want to agree with that uh, when it comes to the leftists or the liberals or whatever, but you are 100% oppressing black people or any race that you are convinced is oppressed by saying they are oppressed. Um, we need to be more uplifting. We need to be more uh, encouraging and positive when it comes to things rather than just defaulting to the negative and being like, you know this is what, you know, bad things are going to happen to you. And this is, you know, blah, blah, blah. It's, it's like, no, we need to encourage and uplift and, and, and lead our children to success because as a whole, that will lead our society, society to a, a more successful society because the, you know, the, the, these, these children are going to be the next generation that are going to take things over when we are old and decrepit and we can't take care of ourselves. So, oh man, that was a mouthful. <laughs> Anyways, uh, that's all I had. That was that was the full video. Um, that was that was our part two segment. Um, again, if you have not watched part one, please go back and do that now. Um, do not forget to like this video, subscribe to the channel, click that notification bell so that you get notified when more videos get released. Um, there are so many of these Jubilee videos, and I want to do more of them. Uh, there's in fact there's one on my screen right now. It is male feminists versus anti feminists. Um, I, I would love to dive into that one as well as a variety of other topics. If you have suggestions of videos that you want me to react to or topics you want me to react to, I'm happy to do that, uh, at any given point in time. Just please drop a comment below letting me know. Um, and with that, I hope all of you have a wonderful day and I will see you on the next video. Take care.